So good morning, good morning. Everybody waiting to hear my voice today. Is it better? Is it worse? <coughs> How are we doing? It'll be a nice day here in Asakusa today, I think. It'll be mixed. It's sunny for the most part, but there could be some rainy spells later this afternoon, I think. So. I'm not back to normal, I know, totally. Close enough, enough to be able to do a stream. I set the alarm last night for the normal pattern, thinking when I wake up in the morning, it will it be on the way down or will it be on the way up? And I was ready to send a note, you know, canceling the stream if I really was going downhill. But I think I'm okay. Body feels okay. No fever, no nothing. I get up. I can behave normally. I had a good, didn't have a good breakfast, but had a normal, normal breakfast. But the thing's still there. It's still bothering me. So, so. But at least we're not getting worse. And I, I, I skipped... Confession, I skipped the pool this morning. Now I think, as most people would think, that's pretty much common sense, I think. I didn't have my swim. And it's it, there's no more than four or five times in the couple of years I've been doing this that I've actually skipped out. I've missed the pool like I missed it two weeks ago for the long stream with Taranson. I wasn't able to swim that morning. But I don't usually skip. Anyway, we are. We've got a frame rate issue, okay, we know how to fix that, just a second. Let's get the main camera. Did you notice, by the way, uh, I thought John Becker was going to ask about this, about the flashing lights. Down at the end of the street, in the Don Quixote store, we have flashing lights on their uh, sign that's in front of the shop. But today, they're there actually in one corner of it. And I was a bit confused because in the last stream I had noticed in the corner there there's no flashing lights at the bottom. So I went down there to have a look at what's going on. It's not an awning, it's Santa's sleigh. And you can sort of see the shape. If you see the two green trees there, between the two trees, this guy's going to block it now. Between the two trees and hanging right in front of the donkey store is a display of the donkey penguin in a Santa suit driving a sleigh. And it's sitting in front of the flashing lights. So I think they will be back in the new year, I think. Should we unplug the camera? We've learned that's how to change the frame rate. Can I do this without disaster? This is the video card for the main camera. So the main camera is going down. People are asking about the street. Today is the third Monday in the month. So today is garbage collection day for the non-burnable, non-recyclable, non-whatever. So there are little white bags here and there full of things like spray cans and broken glass. The one you're seeing just almost in the middle of your screen, actually it's a, it's a bag that was put out by the bar two or three doors down and the crows dragged it around last night trying to open it and get inside it. And I was curious, what would the crows be trying to attack that's in a non-burnable, non-recyclable garbage? And it's interesting, it's aluminum foil that they must have been using to sort of do baked potatoes and fish and something. So the foil must have had this huge uh, uh, food smell. So the crows attacked it and pulled the foil out of the package and then I doubt they ate much of it. But that's what it is today. It's non-recyclable, non-burnable garbage. I don't think we have any at Mokohankan here today. <laughs> okay, today's job. I guess some of you may have seen the Instagram post. The block is finished. Block is done. The outside's cleared, the heads are cleared. And when I say it's done, there will definitely be more touch-up carving after we've done the test print. I was gonna scan it and photograph it, but I didn't have, uh, didn't have the whatever energy last night, so too bad, we'll just have to go ahead. So today, this morning, we're gonna smear it with black ink We're going to take a couple of test proofs. 
and then uh, optionally the work will be one or two or three things. If it looks good, if it looks like I can go ahead with it without too much adjustment, we'll go ahead and start working on the color separations today. And I think there's going to be three colors, gray, gray, and another gray, of course, as you all know already. So we can work on the color separations this morning. I have backup work. Yuki-san upstairs has been working on the printing of the New Year's card print, the one that Taran-san and I did, and there's a story there too. We've recut some of the blocks, but we'll get to that maybe later on. We'll play with that. This is going to be the main thing today. There will be a show and tell today. We have, uh, it's not a dramatic show and tell. We have a couple of small packages have arrived. So we'll have a look at some small things, some small items. Your socks are safe, nothing dramatic. Just some small, mildly interesting prints that have come to us from Yahoo Auctions. talking about a beard that puts Dave to shame. There are many, many men out there with beards that put Dave to shame. I am not anywhere in the beard sweepstakes. My God, not at all. It happens not infrequently here that visitors come in, people with quite spectacular beards, and mine is put to shame many a time. And in fact, that's funny. There was a story. There was a, I don't remember his name and wouldn't mention it anyway. A young man came in here about a month ago or so, Good, big, rich, deep beard. You could go, you could hide in there and go to sleep in there. And we, I remembered he had been here before. And it's funny because as we were talking, I, I remembered. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Last time you were here, we were talking about beards because it wasn't just you and me. There was a third person who came into the shop who had a beard that was like also. It was beard convention day, right? And he says, "Yeah, you remember." And I think here his partner, his lady, pulled out a phone picture of when he was here before the pandemic. And the three of us were there, and it was Dave with his scraggly little nothing. This is 40 years of growth. And then these two guys around me, these two bears, with these deep, rich, glorious beards, putting me to shame. So I'm not in the beard sweepstakes, not at all. It's getting better, actually. As I get older, actually, it is thickening up, and it's getting better. It's now actually decent. But for many years, it was just such a god-awful, wimpy mess. And Dave's theory of beard is, is that there's no theory of beard for him. It's not a fashion statement. It's absolute, pure, unadulterated laziness. There's no way around it. Just as I left the music company, I was talking to somebody about this in the chat earlier this morning. I left the job I had, the salaried job that I had, which required that I wear a suit and be presentable. I left that, was determined I wasn't ever going to be employed again. So I just stopped, stopped shaving because the morning routine and all that stuff and, you know, it was just total laziness and it still is. Okay, enough noise. Let's do this. You know what's going to happen. I've got a black brush here and I'm going to make a mess on this thing. I'll need some paper. The first printing is not going to be beautiful woodblock prints. The first printing will just use a sheet of normal copy paper. There's a couple of reasons for this. The washi paper that we use to make prints is thick, soft, rich. It also needs careful moistening to prepare to make a good impression. And because of its thickness and its richness, we have a beautiful embossed feeling on the prints, but it's sometimes difficult to see the actual shape of the lines. So for the first testing this morning, I'm going to print on normal copy paper. This is thin, smooth, calendared paper. I'm not going to moisten it. I'll just print it. And that will give me the sharpest, clearest appearance of these lines. Because we're not making a woodblock print this morning. We're doing a proofing to see how bad my carving was, how good my carving was, what places need to be adjusted.
And also too, because this is boxwood, very dense, very heavy, we're not actually going to get a very good impression here. There will be gray splotched parts. Anyway, we'll see. Are we ready? Last chance. Kiss it goodbye. surface and it's sliding all over the place. Now when the printers come to be printing this thing for the real work, they're going to really be uh, I was going to say struggling. They won't be struggling because they know what they're doing. But they're really going to have to be careful with one thing. There's hair here. Tut, tut, tut. There's hair here. Tut, 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 tut. And there's hair over here. Tut, 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 tut. And there's delicate lines everywhere. So they are really going to have to work hard at keeping the thing clean. We're not worried about registration marks at the moment. We just want to pull it in. See, we need some adjustments here. That neck is not very attractive. I got lots of places to do some work here. Lots of places. Here, we're not getting our good here. This is the boxwood, look at this. The boxwood is too hard. We're not getting good impressions on this yet. Oh, someone's asking, did I find the missing kimono pattern? No. What's the calligraphy? I think we're okay, you know, I don't see any disasters. I see lots and lots of places that I could think about trimming and neatening up and cleaning up. There's a bunch of lines to me that look thicker than they perhaps should be. Maybe the, the wood has perhaps swelled up a bit as I put the water on it. I have to go over this thing very, very carefully. But I think we're, 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 we're up and running. Someone says, how old is this block? <laughs> <coughs> how old is this block? The more interesting question will be, how old will this block become? How many prints will be taken from this over the years, decades? How long will this last? How many prints will be made from this block? Of course, we have no idea, no way to even think about it at this point. 
over the next month or so, there will be 400 plus images taken from it because we have, I forget how many subscribers, 400 plus subscribers to the Hokusai series. So it will be printed in a few groups. It won't be printed 400 all at once because uh, that's too much wear and tear on the block. But it will be printed in a few groups, 400 copies or so. Then it will go uh, to sit quietly aside for a while. And then over the years, it'll be pulled out again and again and again. We're taking more prints. Let's put this one in the registration box. too much water on the wood, you can see it coming through the back of the paper. printer will have to get their printing paper moistened very carefully. We'll have to be using paste on this, which is going to be a real killer because the paste will tend to fill up inside all the fine lines. It's going to be a nightmare to print, an absolute nightmare to print. Okay, now there's obviously going to be trimming to be done, but I can't trim right now because this block is wet and we can't sit here carving wet wood. So if I was all alone here now and if there was no, if there was no uh, requirement to keep going on the stream here, what I would do is I would move on to some other job. I would leave this alone for a few minutes, a couple of hours, whatever, and let the block totally dry out. I will then come back. Well, I will do this this afternoon. I will come back to this this afternoon when the block is thoroughly dry. I will have this paper by one side. I will have on the screen the original design so I can see on the other side. And referring back and forth between those two things, I will have a go at trimming a bunch of the lines. And what I mean is stuff like this. Let's take an area just as an example. Look at this. Look at this. Taran san is sitting at home laughing right now. Where's a pointer here? Where's the pointer? Okay, now the neck. Now the neck cannot be smooth and clean. We know it wasn't a zoo. It was roughly drawn. But what I have ended up doing here, there are way too many corners. Look at this. Corner, 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 corner. I've got to trim some of these off to make these lines flow a little bit more smoothly and roundly. We can't clean them all up. This is rough hock side drawing. But there's no way I can leave an embarrassment like this. I shouldn't even be pointing it out to you. And it'll be the same thing. We talked about it while we were doing the tracing, you know, how much to clean up and make neat and how much to leave rough and, and hooks I feeling. Same to here. How about this guy's hair in the back? It's awfully thick and black there. Do I open up in the middle to make more white space to have it look more like this? Or do we leave it thick? This one here, look at that too. Do I thin that down or do I leave that thick? I'll be referring back to the original, back to my tracing and deciding what to do. Vivid says, why paste on the key block? What we want to do, Vivid Sam, is without paste, where am I? There's no way we're going to get a good rich black. We don't use paste on a key block normally because it's just lines and when there are lines they will usually print black by themselves but anywhere where the line thickens up like this this line is thick enough now that it becomes almost like a color block the thick area and without paste we don't get a good rich thick black here. So that's the balance. I've got to put paste on to get black in the area where there's a width but I don't want to screw up, of course, the fine lines. 
So paste, no paste on a key block is fine when it is only just thin lines. Excuse me. I don't think this is contagious. I read the chat after the last stream and I heard all kinds of people talking about it. They joined our stream the other day. I had, I've clearly got a head cold, I've got a sound, and by the end of the stream they said their nose was running and they were sneezing. Is it possible? Interesting, you know, there's obviously no viral transmission happening through there, but just being next to somebody, hearing the sound, hearing the sneezing, hearing the coughing and raspy voice, could it trigger yourself to get a cold? I don't know. I'm not being sarcastic and joking about this. It really seems somebody around has a cold, and even if you haven't actually grabbed it from them, you seem to get the same mood and feeling yourself, as though it was incipiently there, and you're weakened by the by the hearing of it. I think there's something there. I'm not I'm not a woo kind of person. I don't believe in 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 you know that sort of stuff. But I think there is something. The suggestion being hearing this person with a cold can make you, I think, a little bit more susceptible to it. I think, but I don't know. Someone says, like yawning, yes. I think there's something there, you know. Yeah, John, it wasn't me. John gave it to us all. Okay, so don't blame me. Put this upstream. <laughs> <coughs> But the question, of course, is not just the chat people, but here in the shop. I'm supposed to be working here today, so I am going to be masked up and trying to keep uh, keep quiet as much as I possibly can. So, Anyway, as I said, so what I'm supposed to do today now is trim this down, but it's too wet to do that. So let's move on to the next step. Let's try and start working on the color separations. I need three colors here. Do I have the original for you, to show you the original? Okay, let me pop it up one second. This will take me a moment to find it, and I can put it into the chat here so you can see it and help me with the breakdown. Hang on one sec, let me find this. HR07. One second, please. Oh, it won't let me use a TIFF file. Oh, it won't let me do that. Okay, one second, please. Sorry, I'll have to open Photoshop here for a second. Nanda. OBS won't allow me to open a TIF file. Excuse me a sec. Export as JPEG. Yes, my apologies, please. Image source, HR07. going to come in big. We're going to shrink it down. Okay, this is the image that we've received from the British Museum for creating this print. We've seen it before. But this is a, a scanned photograph of the original hook side drawing. Now we need color blocks here. Now what they've done is the darker areas you're seeing it on the boots, the guy in the center, and the lower edge of everybody's kimono, 
and the collar of some of the kimonos. There's a dark gray in here. That will clearly be one dark, a dark gray block. A second block will be, if you look under the hair, the guy at the top left, he's got hair. There's also a gray tone has been painted here under the hair. <coughs> and I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think I will follow that. The guy in the middle, the Mr. Long Ears, he also has a gray tone under his hair. But I don't want to use the same gray tone that I do for the fabrics. So that's going to be gray tone dark one in the fabric areas, gray tone two under the hair. And the other idea, one that we've done for most of the prints in this series, is we've done a background tint as well. Now if you look down the bottom left, the guy there with a hole in his chest holding the pipe up in the air, if you imagine that his skin tone would be the paper tone, if we do a very, very, very faint gray tint behind him and behind the other characters, that would set off the humans and the kimono. So I'm thinking at the moment three blocks. A background tint that has the, the background tone without the humans. Then a fairly dark gray tint under the hair areas. And then the dark gray that you see there under the, the fabric areas and boots that are darker gray. But that would leave one question unanswered. That would then mean that the body tone is paper and the kimono areas would also be paper. And would that be enough to make us recognize that these people are wearing clothes if the skin tone and kimono tone were the same? I'm thinking, at first guess, that that is okay because the kimono areas have a couple of things that the skin tones don't have. They've got clear, big brush strokes, fabric strokes through them, and they all have patterns, dot, 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 dots, and patterns. Another alternative is to do a fourth block then. So the skin tone would be the paper, add a little bit of gray for the fabric areas, go a bit darker yet for the background. That's more blocks than I want to use for this. Someone says, why not hair and fabric on the same block? I want the fabric darker. And if we make the underneath the hair that dark, I think we will lose a lot of the thin lines. I want the flexibility. They could go on the same block, I think. And maybe they've, they've painted them here with the same, the same kind of gray. But I want the flexibility to make the fabric areas darker and the hair lighter. But if I put them on the same block, I will lose that flexibility. Anyway, I think, not quite sure what to do about the kimono and the, and the, and the body tone, but what we do need for sure is a background block that will cover the full background area of the print. So let's print right now a couple of transfer sheets and get to work on this. If I put this away for a minute. But there's another thing, you know, it's another factor here. If I print the transfer sheets now, I've got the sheets ready. If I print the transfer sheets now and start making a color block, then that limits me in what I'm able to do when I start when I start doing uh, fixing later this afternoon. Imagine, for example, imagine if I've printed the transfer sheet and I start preparing a color block for the background. This line here becomes the border. And when I'm carving the color block for the background, I will carve it based on this line. But I've already told you, I want to change some of these. I want to thin this down a little bit. And if I've used this version of a line as the version for the transfer sheet, and then I go and change it later on, I may end up having a little white space in the middle. You get my point. We really should, I really should do a lot of this trimming before I do the transfer sheets. Trimming hair and stuff won't make any difference because there's no transfer sheet information that's going to be in the middle of a bundle of hair. 
But those borderlines, the places on this neck, if I trim these, So I think that's going to force my hand here. I think before I take the transfer sheets, I absolutely need to do some of this trimming. So I think whether it's going to be interesting for you or not, I don't know. I think I have to do a bit of trimming here first. Interesting or not, whatever, it's just the same job we've been doing for the past couple of months, carving this block. Let's find a location, zoom in and start trimming. So many questions. You could have any color Model T as long as it's black. That's the same. That's us in this series. You can have as many color blocks as you want as long as they're all gray. <laughs> Someone's asking, have I met people from Serbia? We've had people from Serbia in the shop. Not a whole lot, but I do remember. I, I, we don't have a checklist. Croatia has been in here. Serbia has been in here. Yeah, sure we have. Sure we have. People from all over the world come here. Someone says, wasn't it too wet? That's the thing. That's why I'm sort of... I'm stalling here while this dries out. It's a little bit too damp for careful trimming. Oh, that reminds me. Okay, before we move on, I have a couple of photographs to show you. Couple of, there's a couple of things to, oh, there's, there's a whole bunch of things to mention. A little birdie told me about five minutes before this stream started this morning, a little birdie told me that Taransan has uploaded his newest video. I didn't hear this from Taransan, and he's just too shy to be self-promoting and tell me about this sort of stuff. But I hear that Taransan's new video about the Misty Day in Nikko has been uploaded. Can somebody give me a link, please? Has somebody got a link to this? Because I heard it was in the chat here before. Here we go, Chickenmeister. Thank you, sir. And Nightbot, Nightbot, whatever. I haven't seen this. I'd only heard about it a few minutes before the stream started. So what can I say? Get over there and have a look at it. I myself will be interested to see it later. Hey, that was one thing. The other thing is the restaurant next door. The restaurant next door. The, 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 there's apparently, I'm not sure if I should talk about this, there's apparently a battle royale going on between the owner next door and the employees. And it's about the uniforms that, that, the, that the franchise people are going to want, want to wear next door. We've got some pictures here. We've got some pictures. One of my staff members the other day, I asked her, i got no camera, so look, please take me a couple of pictures of the restaurant next door because i got to show the people what's going on. This is the beef restaurant just behind, just behind this wall on the other side of this thing. Nothing to do with the whale restaurant. We have the first picture here. This is the picture of the ground floor. There, you can see Mokohankan at the edge. In fact, I'm right behind that sign. That's where I'm sitting, right here. This is the restaurant just to the left of us. They have joined a franchise chain called Daiya. Four syllables, three syllables, Da, I, A, Daiya. And they've got a dead cow outside on which you can sit and take your selfies. Great, wonderful idea, wonderful idea. <coughs> there are now six Daya restaurants. And I'm going to try. It's a long, tall photograph, so I'm going to try and scroll. You're going to get seasick here, just a second. I'm going to try and scroll up. Up to the second floor. And Spider-Man is helping them out with their promotions and they have the Japanese lettering there says Kobe beef doro monja and they are apparently going to be serving monja although they don't have any tables prepared for this yet going up to the third floor they've got this banner it's supposed to represent the actual windows of the building and they have the ninja jumping out we have a close-up photograph of that and that's their new character. It's the Daya Beef Ninja. And the 
the trouble that has been re reported to me is the franchise wants all the employees to dress like this with a sword, you know, on that thing on their back that the sword carrier on the back and red and white Daya beef ninja outfits. And there's a routine. They want them to jump out from the back room, bring in the beef and just give me a break. And the employer is in the middle. The franchise has demanded that his employees wear this uniform because it's franchise rules and the employees have all given him the finger. Like, no way are we going to do this. So, and I have no idea how this is going to play out. I'm just sitting here silently observing this thing. There's a third photograph here, and this is the sign that's out front. A moment ago you saw, I just, where are we here? A moment ago you saw the restaurant, just a sec. Let's scroll back down to the ground floor. And in the window you see the four signs. And this is the sign. And I've chatted with a guy about this, as this is he really what he really wants to do. And this is one of their meals. It's a little lacquered box, plastic lacquered box, steak on, steak on the rice. And you tell me, is this the way to advertise things? I have no idea. I've chatted with him about this. I said, you know, perhaps can I give you a tiny bit of English advice? All of our staff members here speak English. Can I suggest perhaps that this is not how you might want to advertise your products to all the foreigners who are walking by here? And he says, this is the franchise rules. The franchise prepares all these things and he has absolutely no choice or anything to do with this. Now the prices, for those of you who don't know yen or dollars, whatever, I guess at this time of day, most of our viewers are probably in the US. The 40 grams of tough red meat, 40 grams, how much is 40 grams of meat? It's about like that much? That's uh, $13. 1800 yen here at the moment is about $13. No big deal. To get tender meat, you pay, what's the numbers? That's the $29, the so one that says 3900 yen. To get premium meat, you pay $52, and the top one, the premium sirloin, 120 grams, is $93, as of today's exchange rates. Red meat, tough. And you get steamed rice, boiled vegetable, which sounds like something my mother used to give us when we were six years old, and scrambled egg. Can I say the same thing? I give them six months. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. They're, they're not without customers, you know. People do go in there. It's never, ever, ever crowded, but mm, I don't know. What can I say? We'll see how it goes. Someone says, are they targeting foreigners or locals? And it seems both. All these signs are in English. And this is one of the main, main, main tourist parts of Tokyo. So it really seems like this franchise is, uh, is aimed at visitors to Japan. Because obviously, you know, Wagyu, Japanese beef, is a real thing. It's an attraction. People come from all over the world to enjoy Japanese food. And when they come to Japan with an image of Japanese food, there's certain things. They're thinking ramen, and I think Japanese beef. I don't think they'd be thinking Kobe beef, but they'd be thinking Wagyu, Japanese beef, sushi. Would those be the top three? You guys tell me. When you think about Japanese food, sushi, ramen, beef, is that the things that people look for? No idea. You tell me. So yeah, I think mostly it's aimed at foreigners. And uh, the lettering on that sign, I would think, would be very, very, very critical. But just all I can do. You know, I've quietly mentioned what I can do to the owner there. He's a nice enough guy. But whatever. The John saying, Americans think Kobe beef rather than the word Wagyu. Okay, well, that's it. And then these, these franchise people have done their homework and they've picked up the words that uh, people want to see. Someone else is saying sushi, ramen, and mochi. I don't know. That's There isn't anywhere you can... Could you eat mochi here tomorrow, today, if you want to eat mochi? Where would you go to get mochi? The only mochi you're going to find here, if you want to eat that today, is you'd have to go to one of the uh, no, wagashi shops. Wagashi, uh, no, Japanese confection shops, where you'd find something called uh, sakura mochi, or uh, uh, a new one is matcha. They've got different kinds of mochi with matcha mixed in and stuff like this. You can find mochi in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sweet shop, not in an actual food shop. Dango gyoza, yeah, yeah, so, so 
Okay, I've been delaying trying to get this block to dry. Let's have a look. I think we're okay. We can we can carve away this. So I'm going to be going back and forth on this. We've got this thing. How much to clean up? Look at the guy's neck over at the right. How much to clean up? Nah. find our spot. Let's zoom in. How long do you sit per day working? On a day when I'm doing nothing but carving, I will sit here all day. And I don't have any back problems. I'm not sitting with any kind of stress. I'm just peacefully sitting here. I've got a little cushion below me. I lean forward and I look down into the scope. So there is no stress on any part of my body here. I am absolutely completely nat natural, relaxed. I also don't do it for eight hours in a row without moving, of course. I'll get up, walk around, talk to customers. On a normal day, I get my good kilometer of swim at the pool first. I skipped it today because of my, uh, my head cold. Okay, you guys go to it. Let me work here for a while. And this is going to be the modus. Yeah, I'm going to look at what I've done, the proof, skip back to the block, and decide how much I should clean up here. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Sorry. Okay, the inside. Here's one thing about this trimming job that took me a long, long time to figure out. I, I was, I've been doing this for a long time. And in the early days when I was doing this, carving the port series, for example, I'd be in the same situation. I'd have a line that was sort of too thick and I wanted to trim it down. And I had great, great trouble doing that because I was doing something that was in the, and basically wrong for this. How can I explain this? If we do this, suppose we look at a place here. Suppose I decide that I want to trim this part here and make it a bit thinner. Now you can see we've got a flat top, we've got a mountain slope, and we've got a base here. And what I was doing when I was trying to trim these down is I used to put my knife against the thing, right down on the base, and I tried to trim it. And it was inevitably, I couldn't get a clean, clear line. The knife would get pulled in a direction I didn't want it to go. And I realized what, you're, what you need to do if you're trying to trim just the top of this, don't trim all the way down to the base there. Don't let the tip of your knife touch that area. Keep the tip of the knife halfway down the mountain, pull back, and now the only place you need to trim is up at the top edge of that slope. You don't need to trim the entire slope all the way down because you'll never, ever, ever 
get a good shape at the top here if you're also trying to trim at the bottom and your knife is stuck in the ground there down at the bottom. So whenever you're thinning like this, trimming to thin something, don't trim all the way down the mountain. Just trim. Look at this. Keep that tip of that blade off the bottom. Just cut back the very edge of that slope. seems simple and straightforward, but my God, it took me ages to figure that one out. I was doing it like this, putting the knife in, ka-chunk, and trying to cut the top of that bump. And it didn't work, because what I was cutting was the bottom of the slope, not the top of the slope. Let the knife float in the air. Hmm.
I wonder in the old days, you know, how much of this they actually did. You know. Theoretically, of course, what I'm doing now shouldn't be necessary at all. If I had actually hit these things exactly sort of perfect the first time, I wouldn't need to be doing any adjustments like that. It's really difficult to see the exact feeling of the life line you've carved, you know, when the paper is still on there, and, you know, before it's test printed. Now they're clean and sharp and visible, but it's really, really difficult before this. So I don't know, in the old days too, did the people uh, do a first pass, do a cut, and then come back and test print it and do this? My guess is for most production work, there's no way, no way they would spend this time on it, you know. Just you do what you can do. Proof it and send it off to the next guy, send it off to the next stage in the process. You know. But for me and for us, you know, we're, we're willing to spend this extra bit of time trying to get this thing a little bit more attractive, a little bit neater. And nobody in the world ever is going to see the little thing that I've just done right now, carving that little kimono pattern into a bit of a different shape. No one is ever going to see that. But I think we have to, we have to Try and work at this standard, you know. Little bits of ugliness here and there, just try and, and clean them up and get rid of them. You know. We've got the time, <laughs> got the time, I don't, but we make the time. Part of it is also, and you can laugh at this, but absolutely this is true. Part of this is also is the the little bit of competitive thing that's going on here. You know, we've got three different, four different carvers working on this project now. Myself, uh, John San, our best carver, Taran San, and Asuka Sensei. And you know, this project is going out into the world, being carved by different people, and whether people are looking at it, comparing our work one by one now, we certainly have the feeling that they will be in the future. So Dave here and Talansan, for sure, the two of us, we're, we're very much aware that, that we're, we're being looked at, we're being inspected, you know. And if I've got some really, really ugly lines here, I would like to think that I can, you know, like, let's get rid of those lines. <laughs> so part of it is a bit silly. So someone's saying that there's, the viewers don't have the original to compare to. So nobody's going to think, wait a minute, that's not quite how the original was. Of course not. Nobody in the future will ever, ever, ever be seeing this. When I'm talking about the things that I'd like to clean up right now, it's any individual line, the taste or flow of any particular line. Because, you know, when you look at the work of Carver A or Carver B, Carver A, yeah, nice taste in all those lines. You don't know what the original was, but you can see the carved lines. And a lot of these now, they're still, they're just not, uh, they're not nice enough. So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to niceify it. I'm <laughs> 
Mom was asking, if I change to a tinted paper like Sexy, would you retire the background tone? I don't know. I can't answer that. If we could see the different prints on the different kinds of paper, the decision would be made at that time. I don't know, sir. Yeah, maybe. I'm sorry to, to fob off, just I don't know. I don't know what to say there. Using a different kind of paper would, would mean a completely different approach to it, so, uh, so I just don't know. I do myself have regrets about that. I really wish we had been doing this series on that tinted paper, because they really, really, really look attractive. It can't be helped. Things are what they are. We, we made the decisions based on the information I had at the time. In retrospect, it would have been really, really nice to have a different paper for this series. <laughs> Can't be helped. <laughs> had a slightly interesting and a dinner experience yesterday. I went for dinner with Sadako and uh, we were in a place that we've never been before. It's a restaurant just really, really close here, just you know, one block away, be before we even get to the 7-Eleven. It's a restaurant down the street. And I've never been in there before because, uh, one, it's upstairs, and the sign and the staircase and everything looks kind of, you know, it looks kind of messy and it looks kind of like a dirty little place and I really wasn't sure if I, you know, whatever. Anyway, I didn't explore it and never went up the stairs. It's a little Thai restaurant. And there's, a, there's Thai restaurants sort of scattered around the district and to a, to a large extent they are uh, very much Japanified Thai restaurants. The same, you know, we have curry restaurants around here or, or you know, the way it is in any culture. The restaurants get sort of blended and changed and uh, morphed into something that suits the local palate. So there's, there's, there's quote, Thai restaurants and Thai restaurants all over the district. I'm not an expert on Thai food at all. I, know, I, I remember having some Thai food back in Vancouver and it was uh, blazingly, gloriously hot. It's kind of too much for me and hot, too hot to the point where it wasn't so much fun anymore because, you, you know, if you're not used to it, you really can't taste the food anymore. I'm okay with normally hot stuff, but not with, with sort of stupidly hot stuff. Anyway, so I'd never been in this place. Uh, during Saturday afternoon, one of our staff members here, Naomi Chan, she uh, came back and she'd been up there for lunch. So we're asking, yeah, how was it? You know, I've never been up there. Is it okay? She says, really, really nice place. There's a little old Thai lady who runs the kitchen and it's comfortable and it's not expensive and it's tasty. Blazingly hot, you know, ito ito. There's different food there. So having her had that report back to us when we went out for dinner last night because I got this cold I didn't want to wander through the streets looking for different places and going here and there so we just went down the street to this place and when Naomi-san said there's this little old Thai lady who runs it she wasn't kidding this is the kind of restaurant you would find in Canada but really really is not so common here in Japan this little old lady, she spoke a little bit of Japanese, a little bit of English twisted. She's clearly I know, from Thailand, and you know this is totally native food culture here. But she couldn't care less about us. And this was really, a, it's an interesting experience. Sadako, I think, was a bit negatively approached by this. But it's the kind of thing you would see when I was back in Vancouver all the time. Here in Japan, restaurants or, or basically any shop, Customer comes in the shop and the, the staff and, and restaurant people or shop people are always polite, well, polite in quotation marks. 
Westerners sometimes feel that the Japanese clerks and stuff are overly robotically polite and it's got no meaning and just why don't you act and be natural, whatever. And Japanese people in the shop, us included, we're polite to people because we want to be polite to people. We're not, what's the word, o obese, os I can't remember the word, we're not grotesquely servantly servile manner, but we want to be polite because we want people to have a polite experience. This woman in this restaurant couldn't care less. The, the conversation we had didn't quite go the way she expected it to at first, so she just like just blew us away. Whatever, there it is, there it is, there it is. <laughs> and it was okay, the food was fine. The food was very nice, as far as I can tell. How authentic it is, is not Dave to judge here. It was very pleasant, very nice, very tasty, and I will be going back. But I just had to laugh at, at the idea this lady is here in Japan, but she's not in any way running a Japanese restaurant. You know. So, somebody's got the word ob obsequious. I didn't remember it. Karen san, thank you very much. You're my backup on these things. But it was good. It was, it was fun. 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 So. And there's little signs all over the restaurant. They're all in Japanese, so she can't be really aimed at foreigners so much. The, the signs say, when you're ready to place your order, come to the little kitchen window. Because it, it says, the, the, the lady in the back is too busy and can't come out into the restaurant to take care of you. There's no waitresses. And the signs say this, come to the window to place your order, come to that window to put your trays in, your, your dishes in when you're finished, and come to this window to pay. But actually, in our case, because we sort of we were new there and looking around, we didn't know the routine. She did actually come out and come to our table, even though the signs all say, "Please come to the little window to order." We hadn't figured this out. There's just so many signs and labels and menu stuff all over the place. But, uh, but anyway, I could recommend it. You know, it's I'll, I, I, I'm going to put it after a bit more experience. I'm going to put it on Dave's uh, Dave's food map. The food map of places we could recommend in the district here to get to, to get a nice meal. But it was funny. She just sort of like whatever. Make up your mind, people. And that's not how it's done in Japan. But uh, let's go for it. You know. That whole idea of Dave being a little hesitant to head up to the second floor to a place, you know. It's not just me, obviously, you know. When you're browsing around what shop to go into, what restaurant to go into, you know, you can see inside from the ground floor, you get a feeling for the place. And okay, I can wander in there. But when it's up on the second floor or upstairs or something, you've got these stairs to go up. And that's a challenge for me, and not just me at all. You know? And with us, when we had our first shop here in Asakusa, we were up on the second floor, and it was endlessly frustrating to us. You know? We had the little signs, come upstairs and browse and all that stuff, and just people would not make their way up those stairs. You know? And we knew it. We, the rent was really, really low. We knew we were paying low rent to get a place that was not so accessible to people. It's all we were able to get. And as soon as the first floor here came available, of course, we grabbed it, even though the rent is way, 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 way higher than the second floor. Actually, it's not just the second floor either. There was an experience yesterday. Yesterday afternoon, it was a noisy partway during the day, and it was quiet partway during the day. At one point yesterday afternoon, a couple of staff members, they were out for lunch. So just me, me here, and I think in the back, it was Sadako who was in the back, and I'm here at my carving bench carving. So the body of the shop was empty. There was nobody in the shop itself. Sadako was in the back room, not visible, and I'm in my carving bench here, not visible. And a couple of young ladies came into the entranceway, looking through the window. And the window is really thin glass, and I can hear them talking. And they had seen the Mario poster, and one says, you know, Mario, Bowser, blah, 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 blah. It looks like fun. Should we go in? And they sat there peeking through the window. They must have done the like peeking through the glass thing, you know. I couldn't see them because I was sitting here and they were out in the window. But I can hear the conversation and one of them says, but there's nobody in there. Silence for a second. Yeah, nobody in there. And they disappeared. 
it was too scary to come in here. Even though it's a beautiful, brightly lit shop, lights and an easy escape route, the fact that nobody was in here was a negative for them. And they just disappeared down the street. So. <laughs> The Avo Cafe, I don't know this one. <laughs> I'm not bothered, you know, I'm, I'm not going to chase the ladies down the street. Hey, it's okay, I'm here, we're open. We don't bother anymore. We've made ourselves an attractive little shop, and if people want to come in, that's fine. And if they don't, they just walk on. We do not, any, any way, we do not chase people. You know, so. Now, as you can see, I'm not, I don't have any plan here. I'm just basically randomly, I'm doing a random walk around this block, just looking at lines one after the other, looking at lines here under the scope that seem like they might be a bit of a strange shape or that could do with some shaving or shaping. There's no plan here. I'll just keep at this for a while, just one by one, bit by bit, trying to find places that look a bit strange. Part of it, I'm looking directly at the wood to see something, and part of it, I'll flip back here because it's perhaps easier to see here. Okay, this is another place that needs attention, another type of place that needs attention. I don't know if you can see this, but try and get the angle here. We've got a straight, a line, a, a major line curving here. Then we've got another object that butts into this line and stops there. Now you see me when I carve here. I originally came down through here. When I was carving this side of the line, my knife ran straight through, shoop, and down this line. And then I came and I cleaned up the rest of it outside. But the fact that the knife ran through that area meant that it pulled up the wood a little bit. And there's now a little bit of a, I don't know an English word for it, I don't know any word for it. There's a little bit of a, a place there that will catch pigment. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna trim ever, 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 ever so lightly. I'm gonna trim through there leaving an infinitesimal white line here. And that's okay, that won't be even visible, but if, rather than the white line, if we had that burr, if that burr was still on the wood, that will really catch pigment. So the original stroke coming through, vroom, left a burr. And there will be all, any number of these all around, all over the place here. Any time that, that lines like this connected with other lines, there could be a burr, burr there. And that was a big one, and it caught my eye, and I got rid of it. Here's another one. Here's a little tiny one here. There's a little burr on that line. Shoop, off she comes, and it will now print easily and smoothly and clean. Here's another one, right there.
the part where we started on this picture, you know, the uh, this hibachi, this is where we started at the very beginning. So Dave was out of shape here. And some of these lines, I don't know, look at these. These lines, to me, look a bit tasteless. Uh, this thing, too, should we clean that up a bit? That Should that stick be straighter? A bit more shape here. This is really rough. I think this is where I was still struggling with hokusai. How much roughness of the hokusai designed to leave and how much to clean up. And as the tracing went on and on and on, I got sort of better at finding the balance here. But at the beginning, when I was just starting this job, I think I left quite a bit too much roughness. That also is one of the places in the picture that's going to attract attention because the object there, what is that? People will be looking at this. It's the Oshibori truck outside. I need to inform you what happens with the Kobe store next door. Whatever, of course, it's some part of the ongoing story. And as long as I remember, I will report little stuff that happens around, around the district here, you know. People were asking the other day, is there a conflict between the ninja across the street and the new ninja happening here? Well, of course, nothing to do with it. Ninja as a word and as a thing is everywhere here these days. Nothing at all. I know. Somebody also, too, I remember too, there was a question I saw in the chat. It would have been two streams ago. Someone said, is that a ninja motorcycle across the street? And we can't see it here because the truck's in the way. But yes, one of the ninja boys over there comes to work by motorcycle each morning. And I don't know whether it's Kawasaki or Yamaha or whatever company is. I don't know anything about that. But there is. The brand of the particular cycle he rides is indeed ninja. It's painted on the side of it. And I don't think he did that. I think that's the actual brand name. So... Maybe it's there this morning, or maybe he will arrive this morning soon, too. experience was busy busy yesterday it's a Sunday uh, school kids are off and they did the experience I don't even know how many times four times yesterday five times yesterday all of us here in the shop we've got the script pretty much memorized we know what they're gonna say when they're gonna say it but it's still so much fun because people in the shop here people that are browsing they most for the most part they don't have any idea what's going on and it'll be, you know, 2.45, and we staff members know exactly what's about to happen, and we can hear the shouting and stuff start out in the street. And then it escalates bit by bit by bit. The kids start shouting when they see the bad guy, and then the bad guy starts the attack on the ninja teacher, and away they go. And at that point, everybody out there is really screaming at the top of their voice. The bad guy's yelling literally at the top of his voice. Some of the kids are really scared. They start screaming. Some kids sometimes start crying. We know what's going on. But a typical customer standing here at the shop browsing prints, they're like, oh my God, what's going on? Because they hear literal screaming and fighting outside. 
And we know it's a game, but somebody here browsing doesn't know it's a game. So people like, sometimes they're like, and they look around and we have to say, please, please relax, relax. It's, it's a ninja game experience across the street. Because if we don't tell them, it sounds like it's the end of the world. You know, like, are guns going to be drawn? Do we need to duck and head for cover? Stuff like this. It sounds that bad sometimes. I guess maybe if you're in New York and if you're in a shop and you hear screaming out on the street, it's time for you to duck. I don't know. What is someone saying? ST, yeah. Show and tell later on today. It's going to be a couple of small small packages. 9.16? Show and tell time? I haven't got any work done yet. No way. Who stole an hour? Okay, okay, okay. You know, it's funny. It's like that. You know, sometimes, whatever, around noon or whatever, it's lunchtime, you think, already. And then another time, it's like not noon, and like, when is it going to get here? Time, no way is it show and tell time. I've done nothing. What did we do? I talked about... Okay, I guess it does make sense. I printed, I waited for it to dry. Okay. I get it, I get it. It does make sense, but... No way. No way, no way, no way. My God. I was going to do a bit of carving on this block. Just to let you know, because you won't see it, because I'm going to be sending it upstairs. Yuki-chan is doing the printing on this, proof printing. So just a little quick update then, before we do a show and tell. little quick update. This is one of the blocks from the print Taran-san and I made the other day online. And you know, the people who saw it, you know that when it came time to print the black, Dave struggled quite a bit because he was trying to get black on the umbrella and black on the hair, and it banged the face. And I thought it was okay. I wiped off the face and still printed it. Taran-san and I and one of the test printers, we looked at it thought, no way we're going to make hundreds of prints like that. So we moved to plan B. So this is the block that I carved that day. The umbrella is still there. The feet are still there. But Taran-san took a chisel and took away the head that I carved. I can imagine it. This is Dave's head. Ha, ha, ha. Bang, 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 bang. And he got a new hard piece of wood. And he carved the head and... Uh, I think the head and the getta on another block. He got a good hard piece of wood. So we'll be able to print the face separately from this kimono. So Yuki-san, our test printer upstairs, brought me these tests. And uh, I don't have, no, these are just the original tests. I don't have them. But still, um, she feels that the umbrella here is closing up and that it's too many black marks are getting inside the kimono, the, the, the umbrella lines here. So she wants me, and I'll, I'm okay with this, she wants me to go back to some of these places, find the thinnest ones here, and open them up just a little bit so that the pigment doesn't blot so much in these lines. We want a clean, clear impression of this umbrella. So let's just put that aside. That's what I'll be doing later this afternoon. Okay, okay, today's show and tell. It's kid stuff today. Kid stuff. Kid stuff, kid stuff. Actually, some of you might have seen this. Maybe somebody bid against me. I think this was on Yahoo Auction a few days ago. And I broke a house rule when I bid for this. Our normal Mokohankan house rule is inviolable. We, this is a rule we have here, and I've instructed everybody who's involved in preparing for our flea market. I've instructed them carefully. Do not break this rule. We here at Moka Hong Kong do not buy, nor do we sell, nor do we have anything to do with book pages that have been separated from an old book. We've talked about this before. You know the deal. Dealers, sometimes, who I would think of as unscrupulous dealers, will do that. They will buy an old book, which has a hundred pages, which is worth quite a bit, but no traveler or no collector is going to spend a thousand dollars for this book, even though it might be worth that much. But the dealer will get this book for a few hundred dollars, whatever, get their scissors out, cut all the pages up, and the pages, one by one, will go in their shop. Original Edo-era woodblock print from 1742, which is true. 
and the people will happily pay $100 for it. And this 100-page book, I'm making up these numbers, this 100-page book will sell for $100 per page and the dealer has grossed $10,000 for something he may have paid a couple of hundred bucks for in the wholesale market, but nobody is going to pay $1,000 for as a complete book. But he's thus managed to sell it for $10,000. But the book, of course, gets destroyed. This happens all the time, every day, every bookshop downtown has these things. And we have sort of told ourselves we will not do this. Now that's easy enough because we don't buy books and we don't take scissors and, and cut things up. But what happens then when something comes up on Yahoo Auction that looks like it might be book pages? Do I say, nope, we are pure, we are clean, we don't deal in book pages? Because even if it's something that obviously was chopped apart a thousand years ago, a hundred years ago, am I still condoning it? And the object we have today, which I did buy for our flea market, has every evidence that these are pages from an old book. So I'm telling you this story because I'm keeping this open and I haven't decided what to do with these. It could be that if my conscience won't let me put them in the shop, then we'll just keep them in the back in our collection. If it looks like it's something that, geez, you know, it just can't be helped, it was done, blah, 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 we'll put them in the flea market. It may be that the diagnosis here is going to be, Dave, that's a slippery slope. Don't do this. I'm actually quite open to your feedback on this. How much of my policy is common sense and how much of my policy is, uh, is just stupid stubbornness. So what we have here are a few pages from some kind of volume or book or album. Uh, let me get into it a bit farther because I put dates and stuff here. This is almost certainly pre-war. This is not Edo era. First guess would be... I don't know, just something pre-war. I was going to put a number, 1935, something like that, 1930. And what we have are, it was some kind of book showing folk toys and uh, 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 objects. I don't know, what are they called? Souvenirs. You know, when you go to, in the old days, whatever, you go to France and you buy a little knick-knack, you buy a little brass model of the Eiffel Tower, you put it on your, your mantelpiece or something when you get home. I don't know, do people still do that kind of thing? When you travel somewhere, do you buy a knick-knack, which is a, a miniature Niagara Falls waterfall or something? I don't think people do this anymore. But if you go back some decades, it was a thing. You go traveling, you buy a, a knick-knack. And it was a physical little thing that sat on a bookshelf, your mantelpiece. I think people don't have this, these spaces anymore. Refrigerator magnets. These days, it's refrigerator magnets. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, in Japan, it, it was very much a thing. And I guess it probably still is. If you go to travel anywhere in Japan, you come out of the station, there's the souvenir shops and omayagi shops, whatever, in front of the station. And you have these things. Now, I'm not going to be able to give you chapter on verse and what all of these are. Some of these might be local objects. Some might be kids' toys. Some might be uh, New Year's de decorations. It uh, looks like it's from a book of folk objects. Here we are. Okay, this one we know. This is a kumade. This is here in Asakusa, the main shrine that sells kumade. It's a rake with a target for getting lots of money and sea bream tai. It's a folk shrine, semi-quasi-religious object that you would buy to put and display and bring money and bring good things. This kind of cat, I don't remember. Is it from Akita Prefecture? I don't remember. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of such objects in Japanese culture. And this, these are from a book that obviously showed a bunch of these. Some of them are specifically New Year. These two are specifically New Year. This is a battle door, a hagoita in Japanese. And they, these are still a big, 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 big deal. There's a, in fact, it's December 18th. It's happening right now in front of Sensoji Temple right now. It's the Toshi no Ichi, the year-end market. And there are stalls set up in front of Sensoji Temple this last weekend and probably still running today as I speak. And they are selling these things. And the number one seller this year, absolutely, I, don't, I didn't even know, I can bet everything I own on this. The number one seller this year 
is not Ichikawa Danjiro. <coughs> <coughs> You're seeing here Ichikawa Danjiro. The number one seller this year is not Ichikawa Danjiro. It is Otani, the baseball star. And his likeness will be plastered all over these things. And people will be buying small ones, medium ones, big ones, giant size ones for their home. This one is, uh, these are all woodblock prints now. This is all done with woodblock printmaking. I don't know what this is called. I know what it is. It's an old, it's a similar thing to the one we showed you a minute ago, the kumade, the rake for bringing, uh, uh, the rake. Oh, good morning, Udagawa-san, good morning. The rake for bringing riches, the kumade. This is a similar one, which is not so common these days. This is an, uh, it's an exorcism bow. Meaning that it's something you bought for your home to do to I uh, know display in your your living area or your commercial area, and something to do with the arrows and bows are this would kill demons and keep the bad guys away. And just just before the stream started this morning, I grabbed in the shop. I grabbed a picture. We have a reproduction of an old Harunobu print, and this would be from the New Year. And it's a townsperson walking around, and a local seller is trying to sell various things. And it looks like New Year type stuff. We have a Hagoita in his bag, pine pine branches. He's selling New Year stuff and look what he's got. He's selling this exact same item that we have in our book here. And I don't know the Japanese name for it, but the English translation would be an exorcism bow keep away demons, keep away bad guys. And I don't think you have to shoot arrows or anything, but there it is. And I don't think this is contemporary these days. I don't think there's any shrines in town that sell this, but I am absolutely prepared to be proven wrong. Perhaps there still are somewhere around there. Is it somebody's got it? Is it Hamayumi? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hamayumi. What's the kanji hama? I don't recognize it. Hama, hama, beach, sand. I don't know. I'm sorry. Anyway, have we been through them all? I don't even know. I can't recognize, I can't give you chapter on verse on what most of these are. And the characters here are really scribbled to some extent that I don't know what they are. This is dead easy. Everybody knows what these two are. This I've seen in many places. I forget the area where it's common. It's a piece of bamboo. It looks actually kind of like a whistle, but I think it's a, it's a noisemaker of sorts. When you blow in one end, it makes a, a noise. I don't know where it's from. If I had studied before, I'd be able to tell you. Akita Prefecture, Aomori Prefecture. This is from Tushu, stuff like this. These are all very much uh, local. This looks deadly, this one. My God, this looks deadly. So was there a consensus? Should I put these in the shop? Am I ethically allowed to do that or not? Should I just slide them in the collection? Do we want to make money off a broken book, even though it was broken decades ago? Slippery slope? I don't know. Give me some feedback later. This is, of course, Kin Kintaro. This is not the most... <laughs> this is not the most creative, interesting way of drawing a face I've ever seen before. It's Kintaro, and I think he's usually associated with a bear, but it looks like he's sitting on a cat there. Would this also be Kintaro? I'm not sure. This could perhaps be, I'm not really sure. Yam Yamamba, the, the mountain lady with Kintaro, because this is a thing. The mountain lady sucking, suckling the young Kintaro. Or maybe I'm overthinking and it's something else. I don't know. 
none of this is very artistic. My God, the drawing and the, the, it's clunky and clumsy. We're really talking folk art here. And the way they've made these prints has very much reflected the folk aspect of the objects themselves. This is not high art at all. It's a collection of woodblock prints that show folk objects. So what somebody's saying here, yeah, fly fish has got it, because the guy who sold these to me, the guy in Yahoo Auctions, was obviously not in it for the money. He didn't try and chop them up and maximize the thing. It's not like the dealer I said before, who broke the book up and then tried to maximize the money. I get that. But by having this policy, if we had a policy that says, well, we can sell book pages as long as we're not the ones who cut the string, I don't know. To me, that seems a little bit not slimy. That's a little bit of an overthought. But, you know, that's the reason I don't buy book pages, because somebody at some point did it. They broke a book, you know, in order to get money. Does this count such a thing? I don't know. Whatever. At lunchtime, I'll read through the chat. I'll look forward to seeing whatever your advice is. The age on these things, someone's asking again, they're just about not quite 100 years old. As far as I can tell, these seem to date from maybe the Taisho period, pre-war period. They certainly aren't post-war. 1930s, could be a bit earlier, 1920s. I don't think they go much back beyond that. And they're not super rare at all. Just casual, another casual example of how woodblock prints, woodblock printmaking was part of Japanese culture. This would be an era before cheap and easy color offset printing. So in order to make a book like this, the, the, the technology of choice was simply woodblock carving and printing. Okay, okay, it's 9.30. I'm out of here. I'm going to stay on this bench most of the day here today. By the time I see you next on Thursday, I would probably, I hope, be carving one of the color blocks. If I do do some pasting and peeling, I will cut some video so that I can show it to you later on because I can't wait three more days before I get started on the color block work. But I will video some so that you can see what I've done. And next Thursday, almost certainly, I'll be carving one of the color blocks. Okay, let's put the outside camera up. I think, is that the vegetable man? I don't know, I can't tell, can't see his truck. Not sure. Okay, we're out of here. Thank you very much. I'll see you in a few more days. I'm feeling better. Thanks for all your good wishes about the, you know, the cough and the cold, the thing that's attacking me. I'm fine. No fever, no weakness, no nausea or anything like that. I feel okay. Clearly, there is, you know, a head cold kind of a thing attacking me. And I think I have the best of it if I take care of myself. See you in a few days. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Three, two, one.